this case is weird and silly. Okay. Well, and dark. Love it's it. It's bad. <laughs> it's fine. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I'm high. Show I'm don't to tell. Like, yeah, exactly. I think I nailed that. <laughs> okay. The Highwaymen are a notoriously rough and tumble motorcycle club founded in Detroit in 1954. Highwaymen Motorcycle Club was Detroit's most feared motorcycle gang, operating out of an ominous black painted clubhouse in southwest Detroit where like a winged skeleton sign hangs above the door. Very witchy. Okay. Don't approach. Yep. Yeah, it's definitely like, no girls allowed. <laughs> to put he man woman's hater club. He, he man woman haters club for sure. To put rough and tumble into a perspective that we can all actually understand, the assistant U.S. attorney, Andrew Goetz, described some of the club's criminal past in a later court filing saying, quote, they terrorized Southwest Detroit for decades through drug dealings, protection rackets, beatings, and theft. They referred to themselves as the One Percenter Club, mm -hmm. which takes its name from a famous quote attributed to the American Motorcycle Association in the 1940s that 99% of bikers follow the law while 1% boasts of flouting the law. The gang became infamous in the 1970s when some members were convicted of bombing, raiding, and conducting drive-by shootings at the clubhouses of their rival gang members. Good Lord. And yes, I will only be picturing this case through the lens of Boz Lerman's Romeo and Juliet from here on out. <laughs> that makes this a lot more palatable. The like Hawaiian button up shirts. Oh, we need to do a rewatch of that. It's. F it's that movie. Bizarre. Formed me as a as a child. Like I associate that movie with you because I know how much you loved it. I. Watched it in Blelly Blord's attic, and we had to have the subtitles on because I didn't know what the fuck they were saying. Well, Shakespeare. It's you were like 11. I know. I think to this day, I wouldn't know what the fuck they were saying. But Me either. Me either. I'm just reading Leo DiCaprio's body language. Yep. Mm -hmm. Isn't, through, um, through the fish tank. Yes. Isn't John Leguizamo in that, too? Yes. Uh, Is he Marcuccio or whatever? Mercutio? Mercutio? I think. Uh, mm, uh, I don't remember. I'm Someone Google out it. there is screaming at us right now. Is it you? If it's you, you can you can add us. Because <laughs> we're not Red Googling Gizamo. it right now. Are you Googling it right now? Yeah. He played the one that was like a cat. That's all I remember. <laughs> In cats? Okay. Moving on. <laughs> There was another incident where several club members pulled up in front of an occupied Southwest Detroit home and fired 15 rounds indiscriminately into the house. Mm. And it's, you know, assumed that people who lived in that home were of a rival club. He was Tibble. Tibble. Okay. Mm. Got it. The highwaymen were so violent and intense that they even managed to keep the dominant Hells Angels motorcycle gang off of their turf entirely in Detroit which is like pretty shocking because mm. there's, I would imagine there were at this time a lot of Hell's Angels. Yeah, as that's, being, a lot of, that's a big driving force. Well, yeah, seeing as how Hell's Angels was and remains like the biggest motorcycle club and then Detroit is literally Motor City, like cars and bikes ah, are made there. Very true, very so true. So they'd probably have a, they'd want to have a strong presence there. So I, I, I just feel like it puts into perspective that like they were so violent and intense that even the hell's angels which was the biggest ever in one of the most like important cities in the midwest for the automotive industry mm -hmm. could still be held at bay by these fucking mm -hmm. looney tunes so the president of the detroit federation motorcycle clubs also outlawed the club and banned them from their federation which like I can't tell how much power the president of the DFMC has, but at <laughs> least he tried. It's like, you can't be associated with us. Fuck off. Yeah. You I know, tried. but like, what does your band mean? Like, you can't have our patch on your leather vest. Okay. Bye. 
Yeah, but like we like we said in my segment, like a lot of this was so political that like yeah, people, that being denounced, people were paying attention to it, whether or not you were like a confirmed or an outlaw motorcycle yeah. gang. I guess it's just so it's this is not part, at least in my worldview, of like the current zeitgeist like at all. I don't think about motorcycle gangs or motorcycle clubs like ever. It's not prominent in our media. It's not prominent in our news. Yeah, but that doesn't mean it's not prominent and effective in certain communities. Oh, I'm sure I I guarantee it absolutely is. I what I'm I think what I'm wondering is at the time that this was such a big deal in the 70s and 80s, was it part of like the broader cultural zeitgeist in a way that it's not now? Now it seems more subset of, like you said, specific communities, often Mm -hmm. like freaking proud boy bullshit. This is obviously a huge part of their daily life and, and what kind of information and media they're taking in but like wherever i'm getting my news and like watching my tiktoks i'm not seeing any of these fucking people yeah well i so, mean i'm just curious it, in effect it obviously kind of was mm-hmm. but yeah it's just it must have been totally different time yeah so uh their antics were not just aimed at civilians or other rival club members they also targeted law enforcement In one incident in the 1980s, a DEA agent in charge of investigating the highwayman was shot as he drove to work, though not fatally. According to the Daily Beast, quote, if you ratted out Detroit's notorious highwayman motorcycle club, you should know what to expect, members said. Um, Snitches would wind up in a dumpster, one former member testified in a 2010 trial against the club's leadership. So, like, the DEA and the FBI had, like, informants. Mm Mm-hmm. And they were reporting that, like, you don't want to, like, you'll get murdered if you're, like, talking about what's going on in this club. Well, and if these clubs are committing crimes, like, Mm -hmm. you know, if if their whole, like, you know, drugs and human trafficking and blah, 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 like, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they they have a lot to lose. So, of course, they're going to hold their shit tight. Well, yeah, they're dealing in some wild criminal activity that would would and does get them into a lot of fucking trouble, including literal murder. Mm. So they're basically the mafia on two wheels. Like the, the highwaymen specifically, their big thing is like drugs. Like, and racketeering, like shutting down and paying off informants and snitches. So the highwaymen got away with so much, like, time and time and time and time again like they were huge in the 70s and we don't see anyone really prominent have their day in court until the early 2000s like they were getting away with the shit left and right well like Mm -hmm. i guess like layering different people like how do you Mm -hmm. know who's at the top right oh so partly this was due to the severity with which they dealt with suspected snitches like that i was mentioning just now They would deliver beatings with fists, beer bottles, and chairs, which, like, it's giving WWE SmackDown. Mm -hmm. When they suspected that someone was a snitch or if someone was behind on their, like, protection payments, then people would get the shit beaten out of them. Ooh, protection payments. Right. Finally, though, in May of 2007, the FBI arrested 40 members of the Highwaymen Club in a massive simultaneous raid. Oh. Oh my God. These individuals were charged with like everything that stuck, but the big things were racketeering, murder for hire, assault, drug trafficking, and fraud. The low investigation. Fruit. Yeah, low hanging fruit. I mean, <laughs> when we think about the mob, like so much of this reminds me of the mob. The racketeer, you, yeah. The racketeer, like we couldn't take down fucking Al Capone for anything except his taxes. It was the tax man who took him down. Mm-hmm. So, like, fuck with the money. That's what they're going to get you on the stuff with the money. Yep. Uh, Because capitalism protects and cares about that more than the people you're actually killing. So the the investigation, the investigation that led to these charges took over two years, relying mainly on legal wiretaps. And the FBI had captured approximately 30,000 conversations. That doesn't even really give us a scope of how many minutes or hours 
of, of audio this was. That's that more conversations over. than I've ever had. Ever and we're podcasters. We have conversations for a living, and I don't think I've had thirty thousand conversations. <laughs> That's my thirty thousand conversations is my worst nightmare. Yup. So thirty thousand conversations over two years, and the tapes revealed that a leader in the of this motorcycle club, which we're about to meet him, was bragging about violent crimes that he had allegedly committed against those who had angered him, including a cook at a restaurant that this guy who was being recorded owned in dearborn michigan come on in one call he claimed to have stabbed the cook and tossed him in a dumpster because they had a fight oh my god yeah in an in another recorded conversation this same guy gave a crony directions by referencing a location as right down there where i shot that guy (laughs) (laughs) which is like how i want directions it's not funny but like yeah. So, so pass on. Pass like the big boy donut sign, the one with the giant donut. Yep. Okay. So you take a left there. You go about a hundred yards. It's like mm. you know by that dumpster. Uh, yeah. Where I shot that guy. Where I shot that guy. Yeah. Yeah. Just right to just just to the right of where I shot that guy. Yeah. Exactly. Oh, great, boss. I know exactly where that is. Jesus Christ. There Don't were, incriminate me. Yeah, but. So there were cooperative FBI informants, which, like, we'll get to it. But this was dicey. And one of these FBI informants was even murdered by the gang that he was discovered when once he was discovered as an operative. <laughs> so I, not great. Yeah, this is a well-oiled machine. Yep. So the guy at the center of, like, all of these wiretap conversations was the president, the, or sorry, Highwayman's vice president at the time, a guy named Aref Nagi, who went by, uh, or it might be Nagi, who went by Scarface Steve. He was known for being absolutely ruthless about rooting out snitches. Okay. So again, from the Daily Beast. I don't want to cross someone named Scarface. The, whose, whose nickname is Scarface. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, the club's leader, Aref Scarface Naji, was obsessed with hunting down the secret informants in their, mi- in their midst when federal investigators infiltrated the highwaymen in preparation for a massive 2007 racketeering bust. But beneath Raji's search for so-called rats was a secret. And we will get to that secret. Well, I sure hope you liked that clip. If you did like that clip, make sure you are subscribing to our YouTube channel, leaving us a nice review, and joining us on Patreon for even more video content, audio content, salacious content all around. Come join us. Treat yourself.